Good evening. <laughs> well, good afternoon, sorry. <laughs> um, I think it is time to start. Correct, team? A team? And um, I, I'm not going to say, say very much because these are the people with the information. I'm just a speculator. And I just wanted to say one particular hobby horse I have, which is enshrined in the title, and that is this. I believe that in the, and I believe, look at this and that, that's good stuff, isn't it? I believe that in the, the things are likely to change, the containers in which people publish, researchers publish, are likely to change in the digital environment because the way in which scholars work in the digital environment has changed. And the tools they use, and also the espousal of multimedia content. Um, not a helpful word, word, multimedia, but I mean the use of things other than text to express the message you're trying to put over. Now, I am very, I've been for many years trying to press publishers to try what I think of as the article of the future in the sciences. And what I see as the article of the future in sciences is not a lot of marvelous stuff stuck into supplementary matter which you can link to, but taking account of the way in which many scientific scholars work to give an example uh, in, the, in the biosciences where quite often the point is a video and the, the text is stuff that goes round the video, not the other way round. In present publishing in the sciences, you have to see the, the video as a supplementary matter. Now, what interested me particularly about the work which I've been made aware of by these wonderful people here is that in the humanities, rather surprisingly and rather pleasingly, there's actually been an attempt to for publishing publishers and help by funders to take into account the different ways that people are working in the digital humanities. Um, and it's only an alternative way of expressing scholarly discourse and it is, but it isn't fitable, it isn't possible to fit it in the traditional ways in which monographs are judged and reviewed and indeed composed. So this is, this is the message I'm interested in. Now, they may not necessarily agree entirely with what I'm saying. They don't have to because what they're, they're going to do is so interesting. And I'm now going to hand you over immediately to Becky and ask her to just go ahead. Okay, hello. My name is Rebecca Welsenbach and I'm Director of Strategic Integration and Partnerships at Michigan Publishing. Michigan Publishing, you might know, is a division of the University of Michigan Library, and it includes the University of Michigan Press, our Publishing Services Division, and our Institutional Repository, so sort of the full spectrum of scholarly communication going on at the University of Michigan. If there's one sort of theme that I think is underlying all that I'd like to talk to you about today, it's this idea that all scholars are digital scholars. This is something that my boss likes to say. And the question that I'm going to sort of think through with you today is, how does this premise affect our work? How does it change the way that we approach um, thinking about humanities scholarship and, and getting it out into the world? Um, what I want to emphasize is that making visible changing, changing scholarship in the humanities, changes approaches, changing approaches to scholarship is not just about um, a platform or a website or an interface. It's about um, from the whole process of selecting and creating and um, evaluating work, sort of moving this new forms of work that's happening on the margins into the center. And we're sort of coming at this from different ways at Michigan Publishing, so I'm going to talk to you about a few different projects that we're doing and sort of how throughout the research life cycle they're all working in different ways to bring new forms of scholarship to sort of the center of the attention. So the first approach, the first thing that needs to happen is to select, to find and select the right scholarship. In order to end up producing something different, we as publishers have to ask for something different and to acknowledge something different as a valid scholarly output. Um, so this is not just about how can you best present the final work, but, but how do you actually develop it and, and choose it and choose to put your brand on it. 
This is the challenge that we've undertaken um, with our colleagues at the Lever Press. This is a collaborative of liberal arts college libraries that have come together to um, do a five-year pilot to produce open access scholarly monographs. Michigan Publishing, along with Amherst College Press, is providing the administrative and technological and production sort of back end. So that's our, our role there. But we're working closely with the librarians and faculty who are really at the heart of this press um, to think about how we articulate an editorial program that takes into account changing approaches to humanities scholarship. How we can ensure that these works are reviewed um, in a way that's rigorous, but that's also transparent. When somebody stumbles upon it on the web and they don't, they're not familiar with the reputation of the press, how will they know that it's been reviewed thoroughly? Um, it doesn't look like a book to them. That doesn't mean the quality is any different, but it's on us to make that clear. Um, and then another component of this is, is the contract with authors. How do we think about the relationship between an author and a publisher um, in a digital world, in a world where the work no longer looks quite like the book that we're so familiar with? So starting really from scratch in 2016, uh, Lever Press has been particularly invested this year in defining this editorial program. Um, the editorial board, which consists of 11 faculty from the participating libraries, just put out the editorial program. This is sort of the front and the back of it, so you're not getting the whole middle. There's a lot of inside content there that you're not seeing here. Um, but it's been really fascinating to think about how we define what we're looking for as um, unique different, high quality, rigorous scholarship that takes a sort of different shape than the familiar research university oriented monograph. Um, you can sort of get a sneak peek from the back. Um, some of the areas we're looking to publish in are scholarly work driven by special collections at libraries, scholarly work that reflects on the experience of the liberal arts college and, and you know, how that can inform pedagogy across um, all schools. Um, the theme here is that rather than picking sort of a discipline or, or a content-driven focus, we're thinking about what is the work doing? Who is it for? What's it serving? Sort of taking a, a slightly different angle on defining the work that we're looking for. So that's one way to go about it, but that's how Lever Press has thought about defining and asking for a different kind of scholarship um, that, that gives credit to and, and that highlights changing forms of scholarship in the humanities. Um, whoops, jumped ahead there, not quite done. The last piece of this is, um, in addition to saying what it is that we want, as I alluded, we also need to have uh, a contract that meets the needs of these different forms of scholarship. This is another project um, that is really being led by Emory University, but that my colleague Meredith Kahn is helping to lead um, from the Michigan publishing side. And um, what they're doing is pursuing the challenge of developing a new model author-publisher contract um, that would be sort of a, a simple contract along with all of the relevant addenda that are optimized to address the needs of a publication of long-form digital scholarship. Um, so this work is ongoing, but all of the documents associated with this new contract will be drafted and refined, taking input from faculty, administrators, publishing professionals, and digital scholarship experts at Emory and at Michigan and, and elsewhere. Um, the contract will be made openly available along with all of the sort of supporting legal documents, um, such as a sample permissions letter, these kinds of things. All the different tools that one would need um, to responsibly take on the business of distributing new forms of digital scholarship. We expect to use this contract with Lever Press, so the pieces sort of fit together there, and we hope that others will take it up as well. Um, what I think is really important about this process is that it will start to normalize how we talk about these things. Um, it takes uh, a video from being, oh no, what do we do with that, to a core part of scholarship that we can um, address it as part of our, our core business. This is what we do with videos. This is how we preserve them. This is what's required in terms of permissions and, and make this sort of just part of the day-to-day -day business. And that's part of making the work visible. So once a new research output has been articulated, acquired, evaluated, contracted, now what? We have to actually make it and make it visible. Um, how do we ensure that it will be available to people years from now, that it can be cited, that it can be found? Um, Many people are working on different aspects of this problem. The project that we're doing at Michigan um, is called Fulcrum. This is our big Mellon-funded platform development project. Um, Susan's gonna be talking about Minnesota's shortly. There's a whole sort of suite of these out there right now. But what we're seeking to do with Fulcrum is to uh, basically provide a stable, discoverable, citable way that media of all the different formats, like Anthony was describing, can be integrated in with the narrative of a work, bringing together the text um, and the data and the supplementary materials or integrated materials that go along with it. So Fulcrum will be able to present the conventional publication formats in a friendly way. Um, our vision is that a few years from now, all of the University of Michigan Press's books will be presented on this platform. Um, but especially it will be optimized to 
integrate rich media and data sets and, and other formats that as yet have not been able to really be fully brought into, into the picture for humanities scholarship, rather than forcing authors to sort of flatten this out and strip it away. Fulcrum is driven by three key principles. Um, it needs to be durable. Um, ours, uh, this, this platform is built on the Hydra Fedora infrastructure that our whole library has adopted. Um, so this is a, a platform for, for presses, but it sits on top of research library infrastructure, and that's really core to it. It needs to be flexible. There needs to be room to accommodate um, new formats, new kinds of scholarship as they emerge. That room is there. This is a modular software, so new you know, aspects, opportunities can be built into it as time goes on. Um, but it also needs to be flexible to allow presses to respond to their own needs and to their own authors. Some authors, um, some presses, might want to represent their entire catalog on this platform. Others might want to do only certain books or um, certain materials associated with certain books. Having that choice will make it possible for different presses, different authors, to um, bring the scholarship to the forefront the way that they need to do. And the works on these platforms need to be discoverable. People need to be able to find it and cite it. Um, each of these books will have stable identifiers as well as each asset within so that you could cite a particular image or video or bit of media. Um, and as well, there need to be metrics documenting who has found it, who has used it, how many times has it been viewed and downloaded. And that needs to be communicated back to publishers and to authors. And that's, that's part of our goal as well. So these are all the things that we're trying to do with this platform um, to create attractive, usable, stable homes for new forms of scholarship in the humanities. Um, but discoverability is a two-way street. Oh, here's, here's our little snapshot from the Fulcrum website and our three key, key terms here. Um, discoverability is at least a two-way street, I should say. Um, I was thinking it might be more like this intersection near the house where I grew up that we called Five Corners. Uh, it was many streets all coming together. Um, we can build a nice platform that conforms to standards, um, but there are still issues with making sure that these works appear in the places where people look for them. Library catalogs, um, aggregated indexes and databases and other places. Um, so yet another project that we have going on at Michigan Publishing, this one also funded by the Mellon uh, Foundation, is to research how open access works, long form works of scholarship are found. Um, what we're focusing on now are, are pretty typical monographs because that's what we've already published and therefore what we can study. Um, but what we're looking to know more about is who uses these, you know, foreign digital open access books. How are they being found? Um, are researchers that stick to sort of traditional library channels missing out on our books? Conversely, are a whole different set of readers finding our books through other channels? Um, and what we learn, we hope, will inform what we do with new shapes of long form scholarship going forward. I think especially interesting is the question of what happens when the work really lives on the web. There's not an easy package, or there may be many packages that it might be put into. You might have a PDF, an EPUB, um, a website, and all these things are sort of part of the whole, um, but if you just sort of sent out one of those little packages, something would be lost. Um, when what you really want is to drive people back to this kind of core site that can explain everything to them. Um, how that works with the, the way that typical the typical information supply chain works is there's some friction there that needs to be worked out, and, and we're exploring that now in the research project. Um, I actually just came from a different session where we talked in detail about this, this session. I'm happy to answer questions about that if there's interest. So I took this picture from um, the University of Washington. This is from their Open Access Week website from a few years ago. But I thought it did a really nice job of sort of breaking down the whole scholarly communication life cycle um, or publication life cycle. And what I wanted to point to is that the place that we're starting from, what we're observing, is that the boxes on the far left, data collection and authoring, um, are already happening in the digital realm. This is what we mean by all scholars are digital scholars. Research is happening on the web. Um, digital tools are being used, whether it's a camera, whether it's Mendeley, whether it's Evernote. Um, research is being gathered, analyzed, and written already in digital forms. And what we've seen traditionally is that then there's sort of a break in the middle. Peer review, um, publication, contracts are all happening in very traditional ways. And then at the other end, they're then being made digital again and distributed and found um, by people largely also in a digital space. What we're looking to do is to bridge that gap, to have all of this work really happen fully in a digital environment um, without kind of breaking things or flattening things along the way. Um, so with the introduction of um, efforts like Lever Press, which we hope will sort of be a, a shining example of how one can seek to um, 
clearly and thoughtfully acquire and develop and, and shape uh, new forms of scholarship in the humanities um, to the new contract that we think will address rights management and um, permissions and business, you know, business agreements in, in a way that is appropriate for born digital scholarship to actually putting the work out on a platform that works well um, and making it discoverable and stable. That this all happens in sort of a consistent way without, without getting broken along the way. So that's what we're up to at Michigan. Um, all these discrete things that I think when we step back and think about them, you know, five years from now, they all will sort of fit together into what we hope will be a, a new whole. Hi, I'm Susan Dore. I'm the assistant director at the University of Minnesota Press um, for digital publishing and operations. I need to stand up taller. I'm, I can't see over my screen. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm going to talk to you today about a tool we're building to publish digitally on the web. It's called Manifold, and it is a partnership um, between the press, a digital humanities center, CUNY's uh, digital scholarship lab, and then we have a web developer partner, Cast Iron Coding. It is funded by um, a Mellon Foundation grant, as yours is. And um, we have been working together for, I guess, about five years now um, on other projects. And, and we were fortunate to be able to then uh, move into the Manifold project with Mellon's funding. Um, some of the problems that we're trying to solve. So as Becky said, scholarship is increasingly digital. All scholars are digital scholars, and that is where they're working. And we want to be able to offer them a way to represent that on the web um, beyond the static ebook form that replicates what we already do in print. So we wanted something that was dynamic and, and, and transformative. Um, when university presses first began digital publishing, most of us scanned our books and created PDFs, and then we went to EPUB. And we, uh, we created new production workflows to produce these, but it didn't really transform the book itself. It, it created a form, a new container that you could distribute you know, through electronic means. Um, but it, it in and of itself wasn't transformative. And that's what we wanted to do. The other thing with Manifold is we wanted a solution that scales, but we also wanted a solution that replicates. This isn't meant to just be a tool that the University of Minnesota Press could use. We want people to be able to um, download and install it and use it to publish, whether you're a publisher, a library that might want to use it, or um, digital humanities centers are another potential user of, uh, of this site to, to work on projects. Um, at Minnesota, we've We've had some evolution in our attempts to transform. Um, it began with the Quadrant Project, which was another Mellon initiative. And what Quadrant really was about was um, workshops with scholars to develop their manuscripts. But one of the components of Quadrant was that they wanted websites where they could post media content that went along with their book. Um, that didn't really transform, but it added a little bit more. Um, and then we uh, created the Debates in the Digital Humanities Project. And this is where we first began working with CUNY and Cast Iron Coding. Um, and I'll get to debates in just a minute on the next slide. Um, then we started a series called Forerunners. And what Forerunners is, is what you might traditionally consider uh, gray literature. It didn't have a home at a university press. It was things that scholars were publishing on their blogs. They might have um, created uh, you know, their own digital files of something and distributed it to, to their small network of scholars and friends. Um, what Forerunners does is it takes 15,000 to 20,000 word essays that are scholarship in progress. And then we as a press are able to disseminate that to a wider network than scholars could reach on their own. And it allows them to workshop, if you will, some of their scholarship as it's developing, but also just publicize it, share it with the community, even as the full project isn't done. And then now we're at, at, we're, we're at Manifold. Um, so with Debates in the Digital Humanities, we this is a hybrid publishing effort. We have an OA edition online. Um, it has social interaction, commenting, highlighting, um, and, uh, and it, we also have then a print and an ebook form. So we're offering all forms. Um, but what Debates doesn't do is it doesn't offer a real dynamic media component. It's the text. It's you know, easy to read, easy to interact with. Um, and where Manifold goes then is into the media component, the resources, as we call it. Um, and also, I should note that with uh, debates, Matt does, Matt Gold at CUNY uses an open peer review process. It's um, a pretty experimental. We don't do that and plan to do that with all Manifold projects, but it is something that 
um, we're learning from through him. So with Manifold, we want to rethink author processes for iterative publication. And this is, iterative is a real important word here. Publi publishers traditionally receive a manuscript, they produce it into a book. You can make an e-book, you can put that on the web, but it is, a, it is a whole thing. We would like scholars to be able to publish in pieces as they go. So they have a chapter, we're ready to publish it, or they're ready to um, disseminate it. We can use Manifold to do that, and that becomes a text within the project on the site. Um, and it can have resources, or maybe it doesn't have any resources, maybe it's just text. But there's a lot of flexibility there to have components that you add piece by piece over time until you have a full, fully realized release version, version of record book um, and project. We also are working to create efficient and scalable processes for publishing. So one of the things, for instance, with our resources is that we have new metadata to make. Um, part of it is that we need to make additional descriptive metadata for accessibility on the web, things that we wouldn't need to put in a print book. Um, and in creating this, we're realizing it takes a lot of time to do some of these things. And so we're using this project as a way to figure out how to reduce that time while still maintaining quality and producing the work that we need. We also want to incorporate the archives and the digital materials that are on the web or um, that scholars can, can publish with their text. Because these are published on the web, this is web-based publication, there is a network that we can activate that you can't do in print, and even to some extent you can't do in ebook form. Um, and so that, that makes these dynamic living works. It is a platform for publishing. One thing that Manifold is not is it is not a place where the author does their writing, and it is not a place where um, the author really interacts with the text. The publishing staff does that. Um, they work with the author to choose what to post, but it's really the publishing house or whoever is acting as the publisher with the tool that would be interacting and uploading and putting material on the web. And so this is the statement that we came up with for what we want a Manifold project to be. And we want it to transform a, a static scholarly project into a living digital work. These things are dynamic. They are meant with their iterative nature to develop and even to develop with readers as they comment and interact with the text, that also transforms the text. And, and we want to enable that conversation within the text itself. Um, it's based in HTML. It really, what it does is it, it ingests an EPUB file, so that is our normal production process today. We produce an EPUB file for a book, and Manifold takes it apart and rebuilds it as a website. And, and by doing that, it becomes very flexible in what we can do with um, the content on the web and also the level of interactivity that an, a reader can have because it's broken down at the sentence level so they can highlight and cite at the sentence level if they would like. Um, there's some technical components for those who would like to use Manifold. I'm not actually going to talk about this very much because it's really uh, above my pay grade, to be honest. Um, the, the developers uh, made most of these decisions with us, but um, for anybody who is more interested, I can definitely share this information with you. So we've come up with this interactive, iterative, manifold edition. It's networked, it's linked out into the web, it includes rich media content, um, it integrates the scholarly conversation into the book itself, and it incorporates social reading practices. One of the things that we are doing is building APIs so we can bring in the conversations in social media about the book into the project page so that you can track some of the conversations outside the book within the platform itself. These are some of the wireframes that we've built, but what this shows you here is an example of iterations of a project, and they could have been added all at once, or they could have been added you know, month by month or week by week. So we've got draft text. We have um, some original research. We're imagining that scholars may want to have um, transcripts of their interviews that they've done with people as they've developed their work. Or they have a draft chapter that they would like to upload and you know, get some, some of that commenting and interaction with readers going. And then we have resources. So when we think about a Manifold project, it is a, it is a project. It is a mix of texts and resources. And these resources um, can be infinite, hopefully not too infinite, that takes a lot of time, but um, we, they can include as many as they need or feel is important in order to make the argument with their work. The way we're organizing resources is that we will have collections of resources 
and those will be curated between an editor and the scholar. And then if they have individual resources that don't really belong in a collection, they can also have those included um, on the site. And each resource will have a card with some information about it so that you can interact with just the resource if you don't want to go into the text itself. And that's where some of the additional metadata and description comes into play because we need to write enough context to understand what they're looking at and interacting with if they're not choosing to go into the text itself. Um, it is a responsive site, so you can read it across any device, and, um, and that's really important. Uh, right now, we are about to go live with a demo site where we are now going to open up our development and make that public, so each week as they put up new code updates, you'll see Manifold Evolve. Um, it works best in Chrome at the moment, but w it will eventually work in any browser. Um, and when people... Um, readers are on Manifold, we would like for them to have the ability to follow projects because as they are being iteratively published, we would like to, them to be made aware when updates are made, when new content is added. So there will be ways if they choose to log in and register as a reader where they can you know, follow a project and then the site will push notices to them when things are added so they can go in and, and you know, see what the latest and greatest is on these projects. Um, when a book is formally published, we'll put up its cover and we'll offer a start reading button. Um, Manifold, as we are doing this in the grant, is an open access platform. It doesn't need to be so. If someone wanted to make Manifold a, a, a site where you would need to pay to, in, to read the content, you could certainly do that. We are not um, making that a part of the components that we're building today, but certainly there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, and we are going to offer buy buttons to buy the print or ebook editions of the book because some people will want that container rather than to read it on the web. That is one of the challenges with Manifold is it is in the browser. You're going to need to be online in order to read and interact with these texts, and that is a limitation that we're aware of. But it, So reading is important. We still read long-form scholarship, but it is only the beginning. We do want interactivity, and that's where the social commenting um, highlighting and annotation will become really important. And that's also why we want to track the social media conversations. We're talking about what kind of tools we can bring in to track the impact of these books out on the web. We haven't made those decisions yet. That's part of the further work of the grant. But one thing we are doing is building our own APIs in order to ingest, um, if people use hashtags or a few other things, um, to bring those conversations into the site so that you can get some sense of the impact these works are making out in the, uh, you know, the wider network. We do have a blog. We update it more frequently than we used to. Um, we update it about once a week with different things that are going on on the project. So for those who are interested in watching our development, um, you, you can do so. We're on Twitter. We, I think we've tweeted all of 40 times in the course of a year and a half. So we're getting more active in our social media ourselves. And um, if you go to Manifold Scholar on GitHub, all the code is open and you're quite welcome to adapt it for yourself. Um, if you want to wait till we're finished, it'll be ready in about another nine months. So thank you very much. And um, Jason Wiedemann is our editorial director. I put his information up here because he's, he's really doing a lot of the thinking about what kind of projects we feel are appropriate for the Manifold platform. And if you were to go to our blog, he wrote a post about what he thinks the kind of scholarship that fits best um, on the platform. Thank you. Now, we've got time for quite a number of questions. Uh, while you're thinking the important questions you're going to ask, I will just say that one aspect of this is that it isn't, these projects are not things that um, Susan and Becky have thought up in order to give themselves um, a nice grant and so forth. They're actually responding to the needs and wishes of the scholarly communities with which they work. Emory was mentioned. There's extremely interesting stuff coming from, from Emory, um, which some of you will know, which are um, which a study completely from the faculty, showing that they're moving in this sort of direction. And of course, we have the whole digital humanities movement, which has been very poor at visualizing the sort of outputs they would really like to have in practical terms. The other side of it is, this is these are publishers, and they're interested in the needs of researchers to have 
content which is peer-reviewed and also identifiable and citable. And this is the publisher, part of the publisher Value Add. I only mentioned, they're not the only people doing this, but this is one of the more, two of the more interesting projects. Now, I have, um, oh, you're going to come to a microphone. You're a kind person. I can hang on to my microphone. I didn't see that one. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I'm Molly Keener. I'm the scholarly communication librarian at Wake Forest University. I am starting to have conversations with faculty at my institution about breaking free of the container, as we've all sort of mentioned today, of the book or the journal. Yet what I heard was that the projects you're working on still very much fit that model. Are you starting to have conversations where you're not even using monograph, text, book, in the terms of talking about the scholarship with the creators? And if so, what terms are you using or what terms are they using to describe their scholarship? That's a wonderful question. Please, would you go ahead, whichever way you would like to speak first. Uh, sure, I'll try to um, speculate on that a little bit. Not, not just speculate, reflect on real conversations that we've had. Um, this is certainly something that uh, has been a conversation in the Lever Press community as we've been planning what kind of works um, we are interested in publishing and what kind of works we're capable of publishing. I've got to stop leaning on this table. Um, one thing that you know came up early on in the process was the question of, of length, you know, the sort of long form versus short form, and should we define a sort of space for a middle form? And, and in the end, um, the editorial board decided not to do that, and I, I think it was much because they didn't want to define the editorial program by sort of the length of the work. Um, they're interested rather in thinking about, again, what, what the audience is and what the, what the work will do. Um, but it sort of is, is built in and understood that, that if the work is born digital and if that's its primary form, it, it needn't be constrained to a particular length. Um, but they did sort of actively decide not to make that a, a particular bucket, you know. Something else besides book or article. Um, we, they, we just kind of decided not, not to give such a thing a name, um, but to say rather, regardless of length, um, where does it fit? The other part of your question was um, even a bit more abstract, not just about book, article, or, or length, but about sort of whole different formats. And, and this, again, was something that we really wrestled with. Um, I don't know that I have a, a good answer. Often the terminology that people are, are using is just you know project or website. Um, those, those are the two big ones. It's mostly. Um, I'm just thinking to conversations we've had with, with editorial board members and others. It's often people in you know media cultures and, and that kind of thing that makes sense who are particularly interested in lots of multimedia, not text-driven, very interactive, that kind of thing. Um, our challenge in talking to those authors from the perspective of Michigan Publishing and you know what we're trying to do with Fulcrum um, is getting those concepts, which can be rather squishy, and, and getting down to sort of brass tacks about what can we and can't we preserve what can we and can't we make conform to accessibility standards? Um, those are probably the two biggest questions, but of course there are others along the way, um, just practical questions. Um, but often what it comes down to is sort of some sort of compromise between those two spaces. Um, you know, getting, getting the scholar to articulate what really is this thing that you envision? Have you already built it and it's a real thing or, or is it just sort of an experience that you're imagining? Um, and if so, which parts of it can we ensure can be accessed by someone who, who cannot see or cannot hear or has other motor con you know, restrictions, any kind of kinds of constraints really? Um, and, and how can we ensure that it remains consistent and it behaves the way you expect? Um, and then how can we scale that because we can't do it for every single custom build site? So often it comes down to mm, how real is this thing that you're imagining? <laughs> what, what do you call it? And then um, the value that we see ourselves bringing to it as a publisher and as a library publisher is, is giving it, um, you know, credibility and stability and um, distribution into the world. And we have to find ways that we can hook into all of those things. And, and that does require some sort of attachment to standard formats of some kind along the way. Um, so when projects come to us, Sometimes they already are with some of what you're describing and, and breaking down, you know, the barriers of, of a book. They're not a book. They're, they're 
work. other things. Work. Right, they're a work. And we have deliberately called something on Manifold a project and not a book. Um, it is possible that you could have a project that was just made up of resources of media, but there is an aspect that it needs an argument. Right, and so if you can make that argument with media, sure, you could, you, we could publish it that way. We have not encountered a project that is fully and only media yet. Everything has come with an accompanying text, and I think part of that will be, um, as the scholars themselves are thinking, what do they want this to be? They'll work with their editor to figure out how to make that argument in whatever form they want. Manifold can be flexible. Um, to have either just text or just resources, but we have envisioned that it would be a, a combination of both. And perhaps that's because today we are publishers of books, and so we think in text. But it, it, I suppose it need not be so. It just takes the creativity of someone saying, I want to try it this way. We would certainly be open to that. Um, we've had lots of different kinds of collaborations come forward where multiple scholars are working on um, projects and they are then working together to try to distill that down into what they want to put into Manifold. And some of those projects will take longer to evolve because they're just new and they have to figure out with us what they want. Is that helpful? Where, where is the question? Oh, yes. Was it helpful to you? It yeah? Was. yeah? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And now, I will bring you, you, I will bring you because you're so important, Peter. I'm Peter. I'm Peter Berkeley. I'm the executive director of the Association of American University Presses. I wanted to sort of share um, a different uh, perspective from an experience I had about a year and a half ago at uh, Australia National University in Canberra. They were hosting a conference on the future of university publishing. And as conferences like that are wont to do, a couple of the sessions were various um, scholars presenting projects that they had been working on. And one was an ethnomusicologist, and her project was what, at the time, I would have just thought to refer to as a website. And uh, if you think about her, her, her area of study was the relationship between Aboriginal music and, and other aspects of Aboriginal culture. And so if you think about what she was studying, you can pretty, pretty readily appreciate how a, uh, a multimedia digital uh, uh, format would be far superior for her to convey her argument than a typical print book. But what was interesting to me was throughout her 20 minute presentation, she consistently referred to her website, consistently referred to her website as her monograph. And at the time, I thought, wow, that's radical. Uh, but after listening to the conversation for the past 10 minutes, I'm not sure she wasn't being very conservative. Um, so, another perspective. Can I just say that I'm more familiar, or as familiar, with the journal context. And a lot of these ideas were being discussed from two th by, after 2000, and certainly a lot in the later 2000s, uh, first decade. And they've all disappeared, incidentally. I mean, it's all disappeared. But this is the point about this is it's grounded in serious work. People talked about it in little conferences about the Journal of the Future. I, I've got a record of one. It's disappeared now. I'm in, in print. And, and yet, it was all sort of you know, gesture. This is actually, you can see they're building something, that's my particular feeling anyhow, that is actually um, can be used for these sort of tasks and they would welcome the chance. It's difficult, but it's going, you'll get a scale. You find out how to do one thing and then you can build on that experience. Another question, Ray. Another important person, I'm going to bring you to the microphone. Uh, Ray Lester, um, retired decades ago. Um, could you say a little bit more about something that Anthony alluded to, um, which is the notion of getting a sort of characterization, if we need to, of the production as a work at a particular point in time, something that is citable, something that can get the author priority, if that is important. I was thinking about the famous article in Nature in 1953, Watson and Crick, who of course were in a race with Linus Pauling to get the structure of DNA. And of course, it would have been wonderful for them to have been able to publish their work with the models, with the x-rays, uh, you know, with, with dynamic views of what was going on. 
But the, what they also needed to do is to, is to get priority. And that's how they got the Nobel Prize, um, because they were in the race. And I, I'm so old that I find it difficult to move into a, an environment where works are continually updated and are dynamic and, and so on. I want something that I can say, that is, that I've cited, and you know that it's the same, exactly the same content, in, presented in the same way as I was talking about. Do you have any comments? You've got, and there's one other question over there, so keep it, yeah. Okay, I can be quick. Um, so with Manifold, the idea is there will always be a version of record, and that will be the, the citable, official, authoritative thing, um, that you can iteratively get to that version of record. You can have pieces that are built, but you will culminate in that. And you could potentially adapt or change it afterwards, but that version of record will always be official. That, and so we thought that that was really important. And persistent, that's right. That's right. You could. Um, yeah, have you got anything to, to add to that, Becky? Because we've got just um, time for one question. Otherwise. Not much. I think we can just go to the next question. Manifold is more interested, I think, in the changing the iterative versions than our, our project. Say who you are, please. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm from Altmetric. So oh, I know who you are. Of <laughs> you <course>. know me. <laughs> I know you. Um, so I actually had comments to both of the previous questions, if I could kind of throw in. So the first one is um, to the point about getting away from a um, monograph or a journal as a container. Um, I think it's hard for a lot of folks uh, to get away from the idea of a container because that's just, we, we need something to put something into. So um, perhaps we need to think about redefining what a book is, what a, what a journal is. It's, that's sort of the flip way of addressing that. The other, uh, to the question about you know, difficulty around this idea of these, these morphing um, research outputs that are, that are changing day to day or, or year to year. Um, I guess the question, you know, as we think about open science and open data I, would be to me, what if Watson and Crick had said, let's work with Pauling to get to the end of it instead of competing with him to get to it. You know, it's a, it's a completely different paradigm now, I think, when we think about these things. The challenge is, though, certainly in the biomedical sciences, winning is a lot more interesting in a lot of ways, and it's incentivized much more than um, collaboration, um, certainly <laughs> uh, with chemistry, which is the area that I know. And the last point I meant to make was, oh, how much th this is field specific, right? Like as a person coming from the social sciences, these kind of evolving pieces that, um, you know, take on a new skin when they're engaged with, that's very much more of a so humanity social sciences thing I think we find than it is in the biomedical sciences, which is actually, I think, a failing of the biomedical sciences huh. more than something unique to um, the other two. So those were just my thoughts on that's it. Thanks helpful, for your Sarah. session. Do you have any comments to make? And then we, we are conceiving of Manifold for the humanities and social sciences, that we are humanities and social science publishers. So as we think through these issues, those are the problems that we're solving. Mm. Yeah. Could I just say that to Sarah, who I know, and I also have, I'm, I worked in scientific publishing, this is interesting to see them, these people, and many of these people, actually going through these things in a really rather impressive way. You agree? Yeah? She agrees. She's nodding. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, speakers.